Hi, everyone, and welcome in Unit 8 Talks, our webinar series on data and AI. So as you know, in the recent past years, AI has gained field with many use cases covering different businesses and different applications. So with that, the necessity of regulating this is becoming more and more important. So today, through this webinar, we will be covering the question of what is this uh, upcoming European AI regulation, what to expect and how to prepare. For those who are new to the series, we are Unit 8, a Swiss data analytics and AI company driving the adoption of the data science for the industry and committed to sharing our convictions and best practices. I am Huda Rwan and I am a senior consultant within Unit 8 and I will be your host and moderator for this webinar today. So we are now live on LinkedIn, YouTube and Twitter. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions uh, by commenting on the channel that you are using. This webinar is for you, so we are waiting for your questions. Uh, if you also, this webinar, what you should know is that this webinar will be recorded. So uh, you can find it afterwards in our YouTube channel. So follow us in order to, if you want to see it afterwards. So let's kick off uh, this session without any further delay. Um, I will start with the agenda. So our session will be uh, consist of three major parts. Uh, first, we will start with uh, an introduction, introduction presentation uh, about highlighting the AI governance and also what is this new uh, European AI regulation. Second, we will have a panel discussion with our panel uh, experts who will elaborate uh, the question of what uh, the organizations have to uh, expect uh, from this regulation and what should they prepare for it. And at the end, we will be very happy to answer your questions. So now I'm very happy to hand over uh, the word to Andreas. Andreas, who is our head of uh, digital and AI consulting within Unit 8. Uh, Andreas has more than 10 years experience advising his client across insurance, banking, manufacturing on how to turn data um, to turn the da data to business value, focusing on AI governance topics. So Andreas, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to welcome you tonight. And uh, I will start with a uh, brief around 10 minute presentation on the upcoming European AI regulation and governance. And then we will uh, move on to the panel discussion. So um, let me start with a very quick intro on, on us as Unit 8 so that, that you also know um, a bit about our background. We are a Switzerland based company, and our mission is turning data into value. We have, in fact, grown very quickly since our foundation less than five years ago. In fact, we grew so quickly that the Financial Times recently awarded us the title number one fastest growing company of Switzerland. We currently employ 90 highly qualified data scientists, data engineers and AI consultants. And with all this great talent on board, we are helping mid to large size corporates in um, Switzerland and the neighboring countries across different industries to create more business value out of their data. And we do this by implementing data and analytics platforms and infrastructure for them and also tailor-made AI use cases which solve their problems. And these use cases can really range from predictive maintenance for a manufacturing company to fraud detection in banking to AI-based product development in the chemical industry, and to creating smart insights for your sales force, to name some examples. And in addition to that, we provide strategic advice on our clients' data and AI strategy. We help them identify the right AI use cases and also how to set up AI governance programs. And this is also a bit the topic of today's meeting. And as you will see on the next slide, AI governance and regulation will be a topic of growing importance. What you can see on this slide is actually that um, AI systems can also have quite negative consequences when something goes wrong. And this actually happens more often than you think because AI systems are at the moment very prevalent across organizations. So here you just see some headlines 
Um, for example, um, back in 2018, already Amazon had an AI recruiting tool, which was um, having heavy bias against women. So they were like disqualified more often from their job applications. It can, can also go to topics like um, even deporting foreign students because they've been accused of cheating in English language texts. Um, so if, as you see, can see from these headlines, there can be very severe consequences which can be critical and life-changing if an AI system goes wrong. And consequences can be job loss, as mentioned, the unfair treatment in an application process or even loss of some governmental benefits or also unfair treatment in getting access to many kind of life essential private or public benefits. You can think about mortgage applications, about access to social care or even like asylum applications. And in consequence, that means that actually these AI systems introduce quite a few risks that need to be dealt with. Um, and also, I mean, some of the things that are maybe not, not so serious, but some are quite serious. So organizations, they are kind of obliged to, to address these risks. And I think there's both a, um, a moral obligation to do this, but also from a business standpoint, it is important to, um, to avoid many of the, of the negative consequences. Um, so kind of the, the risks that can happen, you can maybe cluster them in three categories. There are these, yeah, a bit like reputational risks that are closely also linked to, to ethical risks. Then there are legal risks, so those are, there can be legal liabilities. And there are also um, business risks and organizations in order to, to mitigate these risks have now actually started voluntary AI governance programs. And many of these programs are based on, on kind of typical pillars. And then here you see some of these aspects. So one aspect would be compliance with the law, then transparency, as in that it is understandable to the user and the producer what the AI systems are doing, competency, that the persons who are developing and owning these systems know what they do, accountability, that there is a clear owner for every AI system, fairness, that um, unjust biases and discriminations are removed, and also security and robustness, which means no data leakage and the monitoring of the data quality and of the outputs of these models. Now, what do organizations do to, to implement these governance programs? In my experience, many leading corporates have started to do the following things. Many set up dedicated org units, such as centers of excellence to deal with AI governance. They have also developed standards and guidelines around AI systems. And it's important that it's both for the development and also for the production. So essentially, there's no more wild rest like in the past, maybe even every data scientist could simply launch an AI model on their desk without any validation of the output and quality control. And the last requirement is that every AI system also needs to be registered, classified and monitored. And this can be done with the help of so-called data catalogs and model catalogs where all this information is tracked. Now, um, as you can see, in addition to these voluntary governance efforts mentioned on the last slide, public regulators are increasingly having a close eye on developments in the field of AI. So many countries have actually published um, high-level national AI strategies and, and also white papers. And the EU is actually the first body to propose now a comprehensive AI regulation on a broad scale. So on this slide, you see a timeline of some key AI regulatory initiatives. Many of these are just guidelines or white papers, but going forward, there will be more and more binding legal requirements. Just to give you one example, now here in Switzerland, the revised Swiss Federal Data Protection Act will enter into force in September of next year. And this act also already contains certain clauses affecting AI systems. For example, there's an obligation to make the user aware if they are affected by or interact with an automated decision-making system. And there can, in fact, also be heavy personal fines against employees who violate um, this, 
Data Protection Act and they can reach up to 250,000 francs and they cannot be covered by the company. So you can imagine it like a very expensive speeding ticket, which could even bankrupt you in the worst case. Now let's move on maybe to one of the main topics today, which is the European Commission's EU AI Act, which um, was published as a white paper last year and um, is expected to go into force. I think it's not yet quite clear exactly when. Earliest could be 2023, but it's getting concretized at the moment. This EU AI Act takes a risk-based approach and it classifies AI systems into different risk categories. And I would now just like to briefly run you through these four risk categories. Number one would be unacceptable risk systems. So these are systems that are by definition prohibited. This could be something like a government social scoring, like for example, it is um, already done in China. Um, and also like a live identification based based on like say facial facial recognition when you when you walk through the street there's very narrow exceptions like to to capture terrorists but in general this would be prohibited um then the next category would be high risk ai systems and there's actually two broad categories the kind of subdivision the, the one would be AI systems that serve as safety components for already other products. So for example, a, a safety component for a medical device. And then what's also classified as high risk would be an AI system, which is listed by the AI Act itself. And there's a quite long list of covered topics, which are, for example, systems used for education and vocational training, for recruitment, for law enforcement, for access to private and public services, like mentioned before, and also for systems that are managing critical infrastructure, for example, power plants. And these high risk systems, they will actually be subject to very comprehensive mandatory requirements for they can be put on the market. For, for example, a risk assessment needs to be done, model biases need to be reviewed, also the accuracy of the model and the robustness over its life cycle needs to be reviewed. And there also needs to be some human oversight and also a comprehensive technical documentation. Now let's move on to the third category, which are limited risk systems. So they are defined by um, a user who interacts with some sort of AI generated content. You can imagine these like deep fake videos or audios. And for that, there's actually special transparency requirements. So the user needs to be made aware that they are acting with such a system. It could also be a chatbot. So imagine you're in touch with the chatbot of maybe your bank or your, your mobile phone provider, then there would have to be a banner that it is actually a chatbot and not a human at the other end. And now let's move on to the last category, which are low or minimal risk systems. So these are not captured by any of the other criteria. And they would probably be the vast majority of use cases. You can imagine a spam filter or an AI used in a video game. And there are actually no additional legal requirements. Now, let me briefly come to whom does this AI Act apply. It is, in fact, um, relatively broad. And this regulation will apply to every provider who places an AI system on the market or puts them into service in the EU. That's number one. Number two, it will apply to users of AI systems that are located within the EU. And number three, it will apply to providers of AI systems whose outputs are used in the EU. So even if, say, Google headquartered in the US would have an AI system that is used by, by EU-based clients, then it would apply. And now, in fact, the consequences of this non-compliance can be very severe. There's different types of um, violations, so maybe let's not go into too much detail on that. But in fact, there can be a maximum fine of up to 6% of global annual revenue of the organization who does the valuation, the violation, or 30 million euros, so whichever of the two is higher. And uh, this essentially means that these fines can be higher than even those set out by the General Data Protection Act. And this makes it really important 
for organizations to essentially be aware of this organi um, this regulation. And um, now I think I'm already coming to the conclusion of, of my presentation here. I hope that this short overview was helpful for you. We will cover your questions later. And now I would like to um, actually hand back to Huda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, now, thank you, Andreas, for the presentation. And now let's kick off our panel discussion. Uh, so uh, to kick off the panel discussion, I will invite our two expert panelists that we have also. So first we have Priska. Okay, so we are we are all in now. <laughs> so yes, we have Priska, who is a founding partner of AI, a legal and strategy consultant AG. Priska has more than 15 years in national and international um, legal and strategy advice on uh, which are in relation with innovative technologies for corporate clients. So thank you, Priska, for being with us today. We have also David. Thank you, David, for being with us today. David, who is the founder and CEO of Lakera. Uh, David started and developed many technology companies. He's very and actively involved in AI regulatory activities cross sectors. So thank you for being with us, the three of you, and I will ask you to start with the first question. So our first question to kick off this panel discussion will be that um, nowadays the topics about AI governance are kind of a common talk within organizations. So why do you think uh, AI governance is that important? And do you think that with this um, European uh, AI regulation that is upcoming, uh, this AI governance will even get more and more importance within these organizations? Yeah, thank you very Huda for having me and Unitaid um, inviting me. Yes, ab absolutely important topic, um, governance in general. I mean, it's really um, a thing that companies should implement in general. It's a, it's a good instrument to minimize risks, especially legal risks. And it's even more important to have an AI governance because it's not an easy uh, technology you buy, you install, and that's it. It's uh, really complex. A lot of things go can go wrong. And when they go wrong, they go really wrong. Um, Andreas, you said a lot of risk that could happen and AI, um, it, it doesn't finish when uh, a provider or the company has developed the AI model, it continues because it, it works with, uh, with data. And, and therefore, you, you need an AI governance to have a, a clear view of um, what AI models are used in the company. You need to have efficient processes. Uh, in order really to minimize the risks, um, set who is responsible for what. And this is important afterwards when you have to comply mm -hmm. with, uh, with regulation and have the people then who control the employees, that the employees have understood what they have to do and how to use the systems. Um, also to, um, to have this transparency, this is one requirement that uh, the AI Act says. In certain cases, the transparency is really mandatory. Mm -hmm. And, and also to capture and transfer knowledge, because sometimes you have experts, uh, fantastic people that are working, and they go away and you don't know what happened, how it worked, uh, who is the information. So when you have this written, then you can manage and build uh, secure processes and decision makings. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's essential. And this AI Act is really important because it's uh, for now, only the high risk um, <laughs> category, it's mandatory. But there are discussion uh, now in Parliament because uh, they saw that also general purpose um, AI systems can, um, can or many question are how harmful they are. Uh, for example, these talks with uh, chatbots and uh, for example, if someone, they give the example of someone who um, talks with them and then they ask my, should I kill myself? And the chatbot answers, yes, you should. So, and this is not in the category high risk. And therefore, I would really strongly um, suggest uh, companies to integrate this AI governance because AI is such a special uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Priska. Thanks a lot. 
And as um, we saw, and as you say, in uh, Prisca, uh, today we we have like we feel like there's this tendency uh, to go from um, a voluntary data governance or AI governance to a mandatory AI regulation. So, as you are the experts, what are today your hopes, uh, your concerns about this EU AI Act? Um, as it could come in force as early as next year, for example. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. And also thanks for the question. I think it's an important one. Mm -hmm. But also the answer hasn't really changed over, over the last couple of years. Um, I, um, I, I do see that uh, you know, the, the general direction of having regulations is obviously good. It's the reason that we can drink tap water. It's the reason that we can trust getting on an airplane. And hopefully it's also the reason that we can trust AI in the future. So the question is really more about how can we innovate within that, that framework? And they're talking to, to our customers, talking to people in these regulatory forums. We, we see that there is a lot of information uncertainty. And the question is really, where, where does this uncertainty come from? If you look at the European AI Act, um, in many ways, it is, it is way too abstract. What does safety mean? Uh, I think there are um, plenty of definitions, plenty of um, interpretations, and plenty of ways that especially those developing AI um, would, uh, would, would define this term. What does, um, what does it mean for my AI to be robust? Um, what does it mean to those, again, building that technology in the context of autonomous cars, for example? Um, what does it mean that my data is representative uh, when I build an application in healthcare? So all of that needs a lot more definition. And I think um, something, um, something, something that we see is that um, that can really hinder innovation. If you, uh, if you sit down and do the math, you realize that to show things such as my data set is representative and complete and, and my system is robust enough, and that can quickly uh, create unsurmountable um, work, especially for smaller organizations. So now we have this piece of AI, which is incredibly hard to build. Um, it's incredibly hard to, to put these uh, technologies into production. And at the same time, we add additional regulatory requirements now. So who is the most likely to suffer from this? It's not the Googles and the Metas of the world. It's the small SMEs and startups. Yeah. And so I think it's important to think about uh, where, where do we want to see the breakthrough innovations over the next couple of years? And my hope is that startups and small companies can contribute to that. Yeah. What we see today is that they all ask themselves, what is the ev evidence that we have to bring to the, to the certification table? What is it that we have to show? How can I prove that my AI is fair and robust and generally compliant? So you have all these small organizations investing so much effort and energy and money into generating that evidence. Everyone is building up their own infrastructures um, to, to test and validate their AI. So we need to make all these aspects of the European AI Act much more concrete. And at the same time, we need to find standardized, standardized ways to evaluate, to test, and ultimately certify these kind of applications. Otherwise, we will be in a world where only the big ones can, can continue to innovate. And I think that's a very valid point you're making, David, here, because I think it's important that the regulation also doesn't stifle the innovation and also does it, that it doesn't give an unfair advantage to the large players who can afford the large, the big compliance departments which then uh, smaller companies cannot. And I think also there's a bit of the issue of the, the competitiveness of maybe the, the three big global blocks so that maybe also the EU doesn't, doesn't have a, a disadvantage due to an overregulation versus right. the US and China. Right, but I think it's a very interesting point, right? I, I was recently asked by a member of, of the European Parliament actually, uh, what implications the European AI Act can have on talent the individuals that will actually build the next generation of AI products. And I've probably interviewed you know, around 500 AI engineers over the last couple of years for job positions. Mm -hmm. And what I can say for sure is that the most ambitious ones, they want to play around with the coolest technologies, they want to build the most breakthrough um, applications, and they don't want to be hired to build compliance software. So I think we are, again, walking a very fine line between um, that sort of innovative European approach 
um, that, that we, we would hope for, and at the same time, um, sort of triggering brain drain to these other blocks in the world where regulations are, are not so much at the forefront of, of what companies have to have to do. And maybe I can add also for the talents, what is uh, quite important is that these big players mm -hmm. have a lot of data. Mm -hmm. So the talents that are coming from the university, they having maybe experience in uh, deep narrow networks and uh, needs a lot of data. And well, startups sometimes don't have data and uh, then they are just mapping data or cleaning <laughs> data. And that's not what's cool. That's also um, Okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you, thank you very much for your answer. Okay, so following the, the, the following questions will be that, um, obviously when we are talking about the European AI Act, we are talking about a European piece of legislation. But um, I'm sure that this will have some impacts on Switzerland. So what are the impacts and the consequences that will have the Swiss companies that are working with AI, deploying AI in their systems. So um, uh, at least to my knowledge, there's not yet a proposal for a dedicated piece of AI regulation in Switzerland. However, there is the Swiss Federal Data Protection Act, which I mentioned earlier, which uh, covers some of these AI aspects. But if we look back a few years, there was the GDPR. And in the case of the GDPR, the Swiss government adopted something like a smart follower strategy and then came up with its own regulation a few years later. So at this point in time, I wouldn't exclude that the Swiss government will also react eventually and come up with its own Swiss AI regulation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, for example, what happened with GDPR? Well, in my opinion, also happen in Switzerland because if you think about it in 2018 uh, European Union was already ready with these topics and uh, as you said on your, as in your uh, presentation we don't have this new legislation yes it, it's coming not uh, January but in September 2023 so it's a little bit dramatic and uh, honestly also the Swiss government with um, um, with the strategy was basically saying we wait and watch mm -hmm. and uh, now it's creating a network is tra uh, trying also internally in the confederation to understand uh, how they're using AI and the companies are really alone to uh, settle these topics that are coming and uh, and also I think that what uh, happens with GDPR will also happen um, here in Switzerland with the companies with AI because we are we are in Europe and uh, it's utopic to think that we are not concerned about this regulation. So uh, to be prepared is essential because uh, then you you don't lose this competitive mm -hmm. advantage, first mm -hmm. of all, but the liabilities uh, you heard Andreas, um, I mean, they are not uh, small, mm -hmm. but also what the difference between GDPR, it's data basically, and with AI you can really harm. That's why also the regulation is meant for. There are two main um, uh, goals. It's really um, try to protect the fundamentals rights of the European and, uh, and, and foster innovation. Does it foster innovation? How it's written? Not really. Yeah. Uh, does it um, protect fundamental rights? Well, it's, it's getting near to it. But a lot of things are excluded, as I said, it with these uh, general purpose um, AI systems. A lot of companies will wake up. I yeah. hope that a regulation is a wake up, a wake up call for companies, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, take this uh, topic very seriously because um, if you are applying an AI device for medical um, purposes and someone dies, you have the fines regulatory for the fines, uh, but then you have also the civil action or even a criminal action because someone died, and then the authority will will search who is responsible, who yes. is liable for this. So it can really go very, very yes. wrong. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's true that <clears throat> with GDPR, like we had this feeling that uh, people like all the organizations are uh, running towards the, 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 the um, like rushing up towards the finish line. And we hope that we won't have the same situation with the AI EU Act. Yeah. 
So uh, let's hope for the best. And maybe, <laughs> if I can add, uh, the, the worry is that the European Union, with this act, will then give to the uh, European mm. states uh, guidelines and to say you have to be prepared. Also, mm. as an authority point of view, uh, the enforcement, the judicial uh, authorities will have to be in place. In Switzerland, there is nothing um, yet programmed. So mm. companies have not only the uncertainty to interpret uh, this uh, kind of regulation, but also the uns juridical um, uncertainty. How will, if some cases will happen, or if I have a complaint, how will the judge judge my case? Yes, yes, definitely, yes, yes. That's true. And yeah, considering, and also like when we consider the fines that we will have in case of non-compliance, it's sure and it's clear that organizations need to take very seriously this AI regulation, with this upcoming AI regulation. So what will be uh, the advices that you would like to give to these organizations to be best prepared uh, for this uh, upcoming EU Act? Um, I mean, if, if we talk about the specific advice which we would like to give to organizations, um, I think there's a, um, there's a few topics that, um, that are worth consideration. I mean, one would be the, the AI governance that um, I previously touched upon in my presentation, mm -hmm. which includes having a clearly defined process and roles and responsibilities for monitoring of AI systems, having materiality assessments, having tests, having ongoing monitoring, it's also really a taking stock and a registration of all the AI systems that you have in use and which were developed in the past. And then you would have to classify these AI systems based on these um, four risk classifications proposed by the EU and, and then put them kind of in the appropriate box in the model catalog and ensure that you have a monitoring for them along with ML ops practices, which would help you to essentially also um, yeah, monitor the models, uh, retrain the models, and, and also get a view on the data quality. Mm -hmm. So I would also advise any organization to already now start preparing for these upcoming regulatory requirements. Um, for example, they can already now stop or modify every AI system, which in the future would be classified as unacceptable high risk. And they can also already now ensure a monitoring of the high risk systems after they have been deployed into production. And then um, uh, lastly, I think it's also important that organizations build up the appropriate expertise to do that. So um, this can, can either be in-house or it can also be via um, partnering up with, um, with, with trusted advisors who can then ensure to actually have the necessary expertise to um, not uh, not fail um, with, with these regulations and have the right level of support available. I think that makes a lot of sense. And just to quickly add to that, I, I do believe the next generation of AI systems require deep knowledge in two fields. One is the regulatory side, uh, which goes into what do all of these terms that we discussed previously actually mean and how do we regulate efficiently across use cases and across industries. But we also, again, we have an extremely complex technology on the other side. So I believe that organizations will not only have to build up knowledge in both of these areas, but also if you have a risk of falling into any of these categories that are subject to uh, current or future AI regulations, your engineering process needs to, be very, needs to look very different. And so that's something to consider from day one. It will be very expensive to retroactively when the regulator tells you, wait, you, you, should, have, you should have really considered this from day one to go back and, and revise that. So um, fully agree with uh, Andreas's point. And I think uh, uh, either you build up that knowledge in house um, or you partner up with the right organizations mm -hmm. that can help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe one piece, knowing the part of when it goes wrong and you go to court and having experience um, going uh, and having litigation cases, mm -hmm. honestly, it's better to do something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it must be perfect. It, uh, as we as we see it talking, the definition are not clear, and um, we always say to lawyers are uh, three opinions. So therefore, let's do something. Ask yourself the right questions. See what are the main problematic that the, this regulation is uh, handling and try to solve it. Of course, every company should have a different budget. Mm -hmm. But um, doing something, when it goes wrong, you can show, well, I, 
I saw the problems, yeah. I did something, I uh, asked support, uh, and these At are... At least I tried. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, that is definitely. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your insights, which are very, very enriching for us. I think we asked a question for the panel discussion, <laughs> and that now we can go to the audience questions. Uh, so, Billy, uh, uh, can you please show us what are the questions that the audience asks so that we can tackle them? Uh, Super. So Alexander asked this question that according to Article 2.2, many quite obvious application like automotive and aerospace appear to not be covered. When and how should we expect those to be regulated? Yeah, so um, I, uh, the reason why they're not covered in that article, I believe, is because they are already traditionally regulated. Mm -hmm. So what the EU Act um, wants to imply is that either your application falls into any of these use cases that we list, or you are already subject to third party um, audits and certifications. Mm -hmm. So what you have in, in automotive, many, many organizations, companies follow something like ISO 26262. Um, in the aerospace world, you have DO 178C. Mm -hmm. um, in the medical space, we are going through a bit of changes now with the MDR regulations, um, but uh, those will be um, regulated through um, existing regulatory frameworks. And I believe it's actually one of the most fascinating areas because these frameworks and these standards have existed for 60, 70 years. Um, and uh, how are we going to take something that is now coming from the EU and sort of merge the two together? Um, so I think the, these sectors are actually going to be the most interesting ones to, to watch. Yeah. However, I, I saw the public hearing of um, the uh, Parliamentary uh, Commission mm -hmm. and uh, one expert really strongly suggested to uh, think about these exclusion. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, the discussion is ongoing. Um, so uh, they, these exclusion are also mm -hmm. part of the discussion. And yes. OK, OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe let's go to the next question. Okay, it's Elena's question and interesting points you are raising. Regulation should definitely not hinder the innovation efforts of SMEs. This is why the cooperation of the public and the private sector is crucial in providing practical tools to help organizations comply. Are you aware of any practical tools moving in this direction? It's a very good question. <laughs> I mean, maybe I can also make a start here. I think yeah. um, the interesting uh, part of a potential answer to this question is that you actually have many stakeholders mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. So you have the EU as, as the body to sort of you know, give their wish list out. You have the companies that have to implement that. And mm -hmm. ultimately, you have um, the, the so-called testing and inspection certification companies um, in the in the Dach region. Mm -hmm. You know, many people are familiar with the likes of the TÜV mm -hmm. or, or DECA. And um, they they ultimately have to sort of execute some of these these regulatory um, requirements downstream. The answer is that all the stakeholders are currently working out how these standards can look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the most important aspects is that we get all of these around the table mm -hmm. um, to actually work through concrete use cases mm -hmm. in the healthcare sector, in the in the aerospace sector, and mm -hmm. so on, to actually see what are the regulatory challenges and what are um, some of the technical challenges. Um, what uh, in terms in terms of tools, um, we we do require um, tools that also support the development side of things, um, and uh, ultimately, as I mentioned before, help help especially the smaller organizations in in moving fast while making sure uh, they don't uh, go into any compliance or certification mm -hmm. risks. Mm -hmm. And maybe to add on to that. The regulation is not yet finalized, so I don't think there is just sort of one tool where you can that can screen your your AI system and then give an assessment into which risk category it would fall. But there are many maybe auxiliary tools that can screen an AI system for bias and can ensure the monitoring of the system. I mean, one that comes to mind is Fairly.ai, which is a a system to, to monitor whether, whether there's any sort of discrimination in the data. And I think there's many more examples of, of these sort of tools to, to assist in, in the development and, and also understand a bit the, the processing of the data by the um, ML algorithm. Mm -hmm. Fully agree, but I also believe that we um, already know quite a 
quite a lot about how these regulations could look like in practice in a couple of years. So um, following on from what Andreas said, I would encourage people to already start working with the tool before. We do know what it, all of this is going to look like um, very likely on a technical level, so it doesn't hurt to get started today and uh, uh, reduce the risk of non-compliance later in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. And let's move forward to the next question. Okay, um, so the next question is, do you see the danger that upcoming AI regulation could potentially hinder innovation in the field of AI? Well. <laughs> absolutely, ab ab absolutely. Um, I think uh, I, I actually like that the question is raised again. Um, yeah. I do see this as the as the biggest biggest uh, risk factor. And again, just adding on to this talent discussion that we had earlier, um, I think the the most breakthrough applications that we can build in the next couple of years that will bring us as a society forward, they will be in the regulated fields. So thinking from a talent perspective, if if we want to ensure that the smartest brains in the world also work on these applications and not on optimizing ads, mm -hmm. then uh, you know we, we better create the environment and the mindsets and also provide the funding um, to to let these people um, sort of uh, build these exciting applications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. yeah, and also maybe there is the discussion to make exception for research and development. Mm -hmm. And one part who is also crucial is liability, mm -hmm. um, the, the responsibility of, uh, for example, um, company who is developing in USA uh, and there is a company who wants to import this, um, this technology, then it's the importer um, now has, it's written in a regulation that should comply with everything and maybe it has a black box and uh, how does it know? Mm -hmm. So um, this doesn't help the innovation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, true. True, true, true. All right, uh, thank you. And let's move to the other question. Do we still have? Yes, we have questions and it's coming. Okay, it's Down's question. Will the AI system classifications in the new regulation apply to AI used on the battlefield by EU coalition partners working in the US? So maybe to comment here, I'm assuming with battlefield, you are referring to an actual war battlefield. Mm -hmm. And I think this um, UAI Act, in fact, has a lot of exceptions mm -hmm. for the military. So um, uh, if you look at military applications, then it would be a bit of a different story. So no, I, I wasn't involved in the drafting of this regulation. I can only speculate on why this would be the case, but maybe my, my fellow panel analysts can shed more light onto that. I mean, what, what I can just say from experience is that also, if you look at the specific industries, the regulations generally do not apply one to one, mm -hmm. if at all, to the military sector. Um, so beyond that, uh, not. Um, and it's such a each state have a different rules, and there is also the sovereignty mm -hmm. of each state. Yeah. So the military is one of these topics mm -hmm. that it's difficult to have a, a European one. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Yeah. You can imagine just the example, one country developing uh, combat drones, then they probably would not want the EU interfering with them, like yeah. um, what, what these drones are allowed or are not allowed to do, because the military is still a bit of a out, out of the equation. I think mm -hmm. it, it relates a bit to that. Yeah, yeah, true, 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 true. It's true. Great. And now Dominic's question, which is uh, the legislative proposal specifically estimates costs of compliance and human oversight to amount to thousand, if not hundred thousands of euros per high level systems. Is this realistic? Does it seem realistic to you? So maybe without getting into concrete numbers, what I what I do hear from people that are already somewhat affected um, and uh, go through specific calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers that they are reaching are orders of magnitudes higher than what the EU claims. Mm -hmm. um, the the AI Act will sort of have an impact. Um, so I would expect numbers to be much larger than uh, what uh, what you see yeah. on the yeah. Commission's page. Mm -hmm. And always there are different sectors. There is mm -hmm. the technical, there is the ethical, legal, there are a lot of aspect in AI that you have uh, to see and uh, as everyone knows uh, lawyers are costing and sometimes startups cut the cost of the legal and uh, I've 
unfortunately see a lot of projects that had um, one technically perfect um, basis and then comes to the legal department and the legal sometimes because also they don't have the education on what does it mean technically then they usually also very risk adverse mm -hmm. so they stop the project so this is also um, where the legal field should really have more education with this technology in order to foster the, the also the innovation mm -hmm. in a certain way but also um, not having this classical legal law firm memorandum that uh, sometimes costs a lot but doesn't give a lot of practical because this is not yeah. what law yeah, sure. should do but there is an evolution as well in this field. Of course, of course, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your participation with this unit eight, and thank you to the audience to taking part of this um, of this webinar. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you today, and uh, you brought us a lot of key uh, insights on the upcoming uh, AI uh, European AI regulation. Um, so uh, let's wrap up this webinar. Uh, do not forget that uh, this webinar is recorded, so you can have access to it even after on your YouTube channel. You can follow us also for the upcoming episodes on LinkedIn, Twitter and um, YouTube. And you can also have the chance to see the previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Thank you all and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.